Und komm mal rein! Hello everybody, it's Michelle Marie Delaney, and as you can hear, my throat is recovering very slowly, but it is coming back to its good old feisty self. Today we're going to talk about some uh, news, but Lomi's going to join me. It's going to be a little more interesting, I think, because we're going to talk about some of the things going on with the Donald Trump campaign and um, else other matters as well. For example, today, Donald Trump decided to visit and made an appointment to talk to Henry Kissinger. Now, for those of you who don't know, Henry Kissinger has been a major political player in the um, U.S. economy, our international affairs, at least as far back as I can remember from being a child. And I don't know when he got started. I know he worked with Richard Nixon. He worked with um, Jimmy Carter. He worked with Ronald Reagan. He worked with the Clintons. He worked with the Bushes. And so there's, you know, kind of a personal policy regarding this is, is Donald Trump <coughs> going there to be swayed by Kissinger's policies, or did he go there to learn more about what the opposition wants? Um, of course, Lum is here. Hello. All right. Um, it's, it's been a while since we did a video that had nothing to do with everyday life. Oh, this kind of does have to do with everyday life. Yeah, it does. Um, but it's different. It's different. Today we're going to talk about something that has nothing to do with our lives, directly anyway, <laughs> but it has to do with the political environment that is around us. Now, first of all, let's talk about this. Now, of course, as, as, as Alex Jones confirmed, as did Roger Stone, the reason why Donald Trump went to go talk to Henry Kissinger is probably more than likely is to um, understand more of the uh, opposing viewpoints as far as international policy. Now, remember, um, Donald Trump is not a politician. Okay? He's a businessman. And so he probably is saying to himself, I have to understand the political mind. If I'm going to get Paul Ryan and the others to haven't quite, <coughs> excuse me, quite gravitated towards my campaign in the Republican Party to embrace me, I need to at least have an understanding of what's going on on a more intimate level. Um, so, by talking to James Baker, he also, of course, James Baker worked with Ronald Reagan, which was one of Donald Trump's most favorite influential politicians in his lifetime. Which I remember Donald Ronald Reagan very, very well, and as a young as a youngster, and, and I really liked the guy. During the time of Reaganomics, the U.S. was doing fairly well. Um, so obviously, Ronald Reagan did some great things for this country. And unfortunately, after he had um, served his second term, uh, I already started losing some of his memory in the uh, mid-second term um, because of Alzheimer's in senile dementia. I think it's senile dementia, but yeah, I'm not sure. It's He definitely was getting older, and um, he's still revered as by Donald Trump and Michelle Marie Tlani as being a very influential presidential candidate. Of course, Lumi doesn't really... I mean, you do have an opinion, I'm sure, but I don't really know the guy that well personally. I, I, I know of his, I know of his, his, I know of his, his accomplishments, but other than that, I don't know the guy. Okay, so what, you're not going to choose to side? No. Um, one of the things that Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev did was to begin to break down the boundaries between the. United States and the Soviet Union, which later became the Russian Federation, um, the, the the beginning of the removal of the, of the Iron Curtain, as it was called, between East and West Europe actually began the process of great um, revitalization and great, great vitality for the people of the world today, which is kind of amazing, <laughs> because in our day and age in this country, we tend to forget that um, here in the United States, um, during Ronald Reagan's time, during his research into things such as SDI and, and even just keeping stockpiles of weapons for the Cold War on hand, even though he did indeed want to do the strategic arms reduction or start treaty, he did that, okay, with Mikhail Gorbachev agreeing to help that. So obviously for Donald Trump to go to see James Baker was specifically more or less to find out more about his great hero and also to see if there's any lessons that he can take back and use in his own um, uh, regime. I, I think that's great. I don't have a problem with that. It doesn't hurt to learn from the best. 
if he can, if he can, because virtually he couldn't ask Ronald Reagan, he passed away. Um, now, the other thing is, is now, as far as Henry Kissinger, now here's an old man. This guy is, I remember him, like I said, he worked with almost every single president since I was a kid. I kept asking myself, is, isn't he did yet? I guess not. I guess not. He's still with us, right? So, he worked with Gerald Ford. He worked with Richard Nixon. He worked with, oh my God, I, I lost track how many people, how many presidents he talked to. Is he going to talk to Jimmy Carter? Good question, Lum. Exactly my question. Well, Jimmy Carter is not quite in the same league as Richard Nixon. I mean, as uh, as Henry Kissinger. Um, Ronald, I mean, uh, Jimmy Carter did do a lot of attempted good things, too. Unfortunately enough, um, he didn't quite do as well as he could in his presidential campaign. But you know what? If I was a bomb, if I was Donald Trump, I probably would make an appointment to see, to Richard, see Jimmy Carter and say, Hey, Jimmy, look. Um... You know, I know I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat. Um, but I kind of want to know is what should I not do on my, in my administration? What should my administration not do to make mistakes? Could you give me some pointers? I'm asking you as an impartial individual. Party lines aside, I just want to know what should I not do? What should I do? How should I work this? Because you remember, Donald Trump's a businessman, first and foremost. He's not a politician. He's not a lawyer. He doesn't have any of that knowledge. So any advice that he can get from doing his homework on field trips like this to the various parties is going to make it easier for him to master the skills that he needs. He's got a lot of work ahead of him now. Because he's also got to deal with the globalists. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. In fact, already several Chinese diplomats have already expressed concern that if a... Uh, Donald Trump does succeed at renegotiating trade deals, to be fair, I mean truly fair, that American companies are going to realize that they can make better luck returning to the home ground of the United States. And that would be exactly what he wants to see happen. He wants to see American companies come back. There's a huge chunk of our money tied up in foreign assets in foreign countries that he wants to use first. Instead of cutting programs, he wants to use whatever get back whatever money that the United States is entitled to and use that money to help finance what has to be financed. I think that's a great start. He realizes the first thing we need to do is uh, as a business sense is to make the United States look exciting for potential business investors to come in here. Um now every other presidential and yeah, Mr I mean all the governors in Connecticut trying to get the US the New England Patriots here, the same thing for you, or the failed Malloy General Electric deal, same for you. Always is constantly doing the same old shit. Here it is. We'll give you an incentive to stay. We will reduce your corporate taxes by X number of percent if you agree to stay. Well, what they do, business takes it, makes a short term, okay, signs it for a little while. And then quietly leaves after their stipulated time. Oh, we're done with you. Bye-bye, guys. You can't give us another deal anymore. We're out of here. No, that's disastrous. Okay, um, Donald Trump knows that. And on the national level, it's even worse. So he's saying is, is, we need to make the United States a fertile pla uh, platform for business. Okay, so you make a, a, a business want to come here by making a barrier entry less extreme. Right, okay, so that sounds good. Um, do you think he's gonna succeed in doing some major things? At this point, it's too soon to say, but Ted has already said that they're concerned because they realize that Donald Trump is a hard hitter and he's not going to allow the Chinese policies to continue. And, um, so they're afraid that they, they don't have any quivers or any uh, magic solutions in their bag of tricks because Obama knows it. I mean, uh, Donald Trump knows the tricks. Donald Trump um, is going to counter them with his own bag of tricks. He's pro-American. Mm -hmm. He's pro-U.S. Donald Trump is not going to allow 
Our science forces take this country to the cleaners. Again. So I think we're seeing talking to Henry Kissinger and James Baker is what he's trying to do is have a more rounded understanding of what he's going to be dealing with. Not to have him sway his position. He's not going to sway his position. But he wants to know, and any smart business person, I don't care if you're a politician or not, needs to know this. You need to know what your ad position's up to so you know how to best negotiate around that little trick. So that they can't pull it, and yet if they do try, you know it, you get it, and you go, uh huh, uh huh, we're gonna go in there. Exactly. So that's that's what he wants to do. He wants to kind of balance the, the playing field. Exactly. Okay. So let's see how he does in November, and let's see how well it works out for him as a and vote for whoever you're going to vote for. I don't care if it's Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or even Hillary Ratton Clinton, but, well, it's up to you. Um, the most important thing is this. Oh, no, there's another story. Well, might as well talk about Bernie Sanders for a minute. Bernie Sanders, in several markets, is got more done, is doing better than Hillary Ratton Clinton. Oh, big time. But when it came to Nevada... His delegates were angry at the Iowa um, State Caucus. It was going to give so many delegates to Hillary Clinton. And they said, and they just said that some of his men became unruly. Well, let's talk about that. It's not a new thing. Um, and I don't blame him for feeling that way. It's just like Donald Trump said, the system is rigged against you. If you can manage to successfully win by fair means, as Donald Trump had done, congratulations. But that's not the way it normally goes, okay? Even Ted Cruz a couple times has muttered in his breath that he wants to find a way to save himself in Cleveland. He doesn't have any delegates. Because he's suspending his campaign, he doesn't have the delegates. Exactly. So... It's a fool's errand to try to say, oh, I'm going to beat this guy. With what? You only had 500 delegates that you lost because you suspended your campaign? Where he's got more than twice the number you have? Isn't that kind of bordering on stupidity? Yes, it is. Yes, it certainly is. And let me ask you a question now. Um, different political tack. Okay. Um, do you think it really matters if Michelle Obama is a boy or a girl? I don't really think it matters. I personally don't know what to say about that. Is Michelle, is Michelle Obama a boy or a girl? Frankly, I don't care. Either way. Let's talk about that. Okay. You know, because, yeah, it keeps coming up. I'm going to talk about this for all the transgender out there. Okay, for now, we're going to leave the hermaphrodites out because hermaphrodites and transgenderism is a bit different. Lori was asking what the difference was last night. So let me just give you a quick um, Cliff Notes version. Hermaphrodite slash intersex is a medical condition that has a medical manifestation, can be proven by a variety of medical tests, that the person has ambiguous genitalia or has an ambiguous gender. Or that gender may not necessarily match, but again, it's based on physical, biological facts. That's hermaphroditism slash intersex. Transgender people are, for all intents and purposes, medically the sex they were born as. Proper boys, proper girls. No problems. But they want to be the opposite sex. So they go through a variety of treatments and tests to determine their eligibility. And then the oldest system is what's called the Benjamin Standards of Treatment. Now, the Benjamin Standards of Treatment, unfortunately, has got a lot of people kind of up in arms because it's too complicated, too expensive, and it takes too long. So just like President Barack Obama wanted to say in the Department of Education matter is, if a boy says he's a girl, he's a girl. If his parents say he's a girl, he's a girl. Well, that's a little too loose. 
Yeah, that's too loose. That's way too loose. That's too loose. Okay? Now, anybody who's going through that, I don't care if you're going through the Benjamin Standards or some other standards, you got enough of a trial and tribulation in your hand. You're trying to interface, and interface is the right word here, with the world of the other sex. And you're going to have to face that you're going to come home with potentially a couple bloody noses. Or even worse, a couple broken noses. Because what you're doing makes some people get really, really angry at you because it's not mainstream. Look, we all seen the movies in the 70s and 80s, Tootsie, Victor Victoria, the TV show Buzz and Buddies, when that must have been up to, right? Probably the first time you ever actually ran into transgender and transvestites. It shows like that. They're comedies. But let's talk about the real drama of the reality. Those people who in real life who do that, have found their homes destroyed, their, their families abandoned, and their, their, their girlfriends leave them. Many find themselves homeless and jobless. And it's cold and it's dark and there's no love around you. It's worse if you're a teenager because, like I said, your families disown you, they throw you away. So many young transgendered people commit suicide because there's no support for them. Honey, I'm a hermaphrodite, but you know what? My parents threw me away too. They treated me for dead. And I have a medical condition. So I do understand your pain. I've been there, okay? It's not fi It's not fair. It isn't fair. The difference is, is I have a medical documentation. I have a medical diagnosis that proves that I am who I am. And there's nobody questioning that anymore. It used to be. But the, those people pretty much quietly kind of backed away when they said the medical documentation from the medical team. They realized that this was different. The most important thing that the LGBT community has got to do in all cases, please, the LGBT community, could you help the hermaphrodites too? We really could use your help. I'm telling you from my own personal experience. There's so many of us that are so confused that they don't know what to do. Now, I've been, I've been open who I am since I was diagnosed in 1993. And... I have come a long way from those days. But you know what? Sometimes I can still use a hug too. After all, it's not like it's the most common thing in Winstead to see your Maverick in this town. A lot of Winstead, like a lot of small town in America, tends to follow the, the misunderstood concepts like you see in TV and they're not ready to deal with the truth. I'm the only one of my kind in Winstead to my knowledge. And I mean... Hey, I can use the help too. I can use support, so I can use friends. Because, you know, there's sometimes when I just switch like any other young individual going through the trials and tribulations of life, say, could someone please hug me? I really could use one. Because it's true. So you see, transgender people, I understand your pain. And I just wish, because of your situation and the way Obama has turned it into a circus that you yourself should say no. I don't agree with that agenda because it's, it's negative. It's a negative program. It's going to hurt my people. It's going to hurt the people I really represent. And, uh, and it's not right. I want to see the transgendered stand up too because I know you have feelings on that. Some of you guys, of course, may take a while to come out, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with, if you think something is wrong, you need to stand up and say, this isn't right. That's a fact. Amen, sister. I think you're right about that. I think these people are probably not too sure where they stand on the fence. Sometimes I'm, I'm not even sure where I stand on the fence. Because I'm listening to both sides of the defense argument, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to feel. Yeah. So, but if something is wrong and something doesn't seem right, it should be ameliorated one way or another. Now, um, today we're going to talk about something 
Um, one more thing, because I know I wanted to keep. It's, we have to keep videos in for this week for the cable program too, and yes, we do. Mm -hmm. So I want to use this program for both. Okay. The first thing is this. According to several medical veterinary doctors, they say that the rate increase of obesity among cats and dogs. An increase of type 2 diabetes among cats and dogs is up by a huge number. And part of the reason is, is that people have been giving, especially dogs, people food. Ladies and gentlemen, people food, I hate to say it, is not good for your animal. I, just, I don't even know if it's good for us either, I'm going to think of it. But it definitely is not good for your animal. Please, if you truly love your pets, feed them something that's appropriate for their needs. Don't feed them people food, okay? It's shortening the life of your, and the quality of life of your pet, big time. Now, speaking of pets, PETA, that's the uh, people for ethical treatment of animals, is rallying happily over the fact that they've succeeded in causing so much damage to circuses all around the world. But now, they want to go ahead and attack something completely new and really unnasty, uncharted waters. They want to attack pet caregivers who have their own pets, such as cats and dogs, saying that animals are not meant to be pets. That's true, they're not, but here's the deal. For many people, I see my cats as my equals, not as pets. My cats are not my property. I don't own Rusty, I don't own Fame. I take care of them, I'm a caregiver. They're allowed to go in and out as they want. They are allowed to be themselves. No, Rusty has never been fixed. He's a happy, young, strapping little lad. He's all muscles. He's a happy cat. He has a wonderful outdoor life. And he's strong and vibrant, powerful. Fame is 14 years old and fat as a house. He was fixed by his prior caregiver. And uh, and that kills the cats. They'll be out big time. And, and that makes the cat feel like he's nothing. It's, it's true with human beings, too. I mean, sure, he's 13, 14 years old now, but that doesn't mean that fame over here, which is just going to be walking by me, isn't going to want, if he was allowed to keep his masculinity, he would have been a big, muscular cat. Big, strong, strapping young old lad. He would have been out there and spreading his genetic material far and wide. He still would have been a sweet cat. I don't understand how anybody can say that we shouldn't take care of cats or dogs as our housemates. We have benefited much by the presence. And by, as I said, I see them as equal, but I'm an exception to the rule. There's a lot more people that see them as property. I don't see my cats as property. I see them as non-human roommates or apartment mates that I share my home with. And they're allowed to be free spirits. They can go in and out, and they do what they want. Now, one of the things, too, Peter doesn't mention is they're the people who keep saying spay in to our pets. Well, according to your own agenda, doesn't that kind of go against the idea that we shouldn't be dictating the well-being of our pets? But you got to remember one thing about pets, cats especially, okay? Cats are an interesting place in the food chain, okay? The predators, they hit small rodents and things, but they also are prey. They get eaten by foxes, wolves, coyotes. Yes, other cats, bigger cats like mountain lions and lynxes. But the thing is, is because of the cute factor, we have taken them into our homes and, and they have served us as, as rodent exterminators. And even in England, even in the, the mayor of Rome wants to bring in 250,000 cats from Asia for catching the rats and mice in Rome that is exploding. Population is three mice or three rats to every human being. Same thing in New York City. It's hard because we don't want the cat population to explode, but at the same time, because we, we love them so much, and we do. But I don't see my I don't see how PETA can walk this bipolar game of theirs. 
saying to do one thing and yet say something completely different goes beyond any comprehension. So I'm going to stay behind my statement and stay as, and believe because I believe it. It's not just a statement. My home has three mates, two non-human, one human. And all three apartment mates are seen as equals. And all three respectfully respect each other's space. And they're happy and they're content. And they all have agreed to live by the same house rules. They don't spray in the house. They take it outside to the cat box. Or, they, or outside or go to the cat box or both. That's a compromise that we all live with. It's a compromise we all understand. So, as I said, watch out for PETA and their kind of mixed answer to cat care because in some ways their policy makes no sense at all. And they are not against the idea of forced spaying and neutering of pets. I have to say, why don't we spay and neuter human beings? At least, if we're going to do that to another creature, Maybe we should do it to ourselves, too. At least we know what the ramifications will be of doing so. All right, guys, that's it for now. But, uh, oh, you want to say anything before you go? Um, just want to say this. I'm glad Michelle's feeling better and that Michelle still has some scar tissue. But I think Michelle's come a long way. And that uh, we still need your support. And any support you can give, we can use to help to make our videos better. And also, I've got one question for you. Is that, you ever going to get the multimedia studio fixed up? Well, normally we use the multimedia studio in, the studio in uh, October through March. Right. And it's already summer. So, probably we're going to reopen the studio maybe around March of, or maybe around October of this year gonna have to figure out what to put the Raspberry Pi because Dory likes to use it. Yes, we do. We'll have to figure that out. But that's a topic for later. Right. Okay, guys. Look, for now, I want to thank you all for watching this video. I want you to know that I am really looking forward to your comments, your suggestions, your advice, your complaints, whatever. I'm listening. And I will respond as timely manner as I can. If it's something that needs me to do a little research first, give me some time, and I will get back with an answer. Okay? And thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.